Estimados participantes en el programa Jóvenes de Luna Sur por una economía social y la integración regional. Estimados eh, amigos eh, de Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Perú, Ecuador, Colombia y Venezuela. Eh, vamos a tener eh, la oportunidad de escuchar ahora a uno de los eh, líderes fundamentales eh, a nivel internacional y mundial eh, de la lucha por el medio ambiente. Ustedes escucharon a Marty Sen, escucharon a Rebeca Greenspan, escucharon una intervención central mía y ahora, como está pautado en el programa, van a escuchar a Olaf Korgen. Eh, estamos eh, en las oficinas de Olaf Korgen en las Naciones Unidas, en Nueva York. Olaf Korgen ha hecho una carrera de servicios muy importantes al género humano es noruego, el país que encabeza como hemos visto en el programa una y otra vez eh, la tabla de desarrollo humano del mundo eh, Olaf ha sido viceministro de relaciones exteriores de cooperación eh, de Noruega eh, dirigió el departamento de medio ambiente de la oficina de desarrollo de políticas del PNUD y es actualmente el director de la Oficina de Desarrollo de Políticas para el Desarrollo del PNUD. Es un luchador eh, totalmente entregado, talentoso, visionario y líder por un mundo mejor. Los dejo con él. Hola, eh, buenos días. Y es un gran honor eh, para mí participar en este programa eh, tan importante. Y uh, es un honor hablar con to todos ustedes, eh, eh, jóvenes líderes de tantos países en América Latina, y hablar eh, sobre temas que, que son los más importantes eh, en nuestro mundo de, de hoy. Y uh, eh, espero que podamos tener, un, tener una conversación eh, que puede contribuir a el trabajo que, que hacéis eh, vosotros y en formar un futuro mejor para eh, los países eh, de, de, de donde llegáis y, y para toda la región y para todo el mundo. Y mis disculpas por cambiar al inglés porque es, eh, es un poco más fácil para mí eh, exp eh, expresar eh, las eh, ideas que, que tengo en, en eh, inglés y espero que sea posible para vosotros eh, tener eh, la traducción eh, adecuada. Um, so, let me uh, start. I've been asked to speak to you about the uh, challenge of uh, uh, environmental sustainability in today's world, but I'm very aware that this is uh, taking place within the context where you are looking at uh, other uh, issues and challenges and of course they are all uh, intertwined and interrelated and uh, uh, as I speak you will notice that I, I am a very firm believer in the need to look at different challenges in a very interconnected way in order for us to be able to address them appropriately. In, uh, it's my view, and I think it's uh, uh, fairly well backed up by what we today know scientifically, that the greatest and most uh, urgent challenge of our time is uh, uh, nothing less than planetary destabilization. What uh, we are witnessing today is really the um, uh, early uh, acceleration of uh, a climate system that is destabilizing. It's uh, the early uh, acceleration of uh, 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 destruction of critical ecosystems that not only nature uh, 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 depends on for, for the well-being of multiple uh, species and for, for the, e the ecological processes that unfold every day, but in fact the ecosystems that we as humanity, as human civilization, fundamentally depend on for our survival and, and, and well-being. We're seeing uh, growing and dramatically growing impacts on 
people in many, many parts of the world and uh, it's impacting on life, on uh, uh, livelihoods and it's impacting on the security even of, uh, of communities and of nations and uh, sowing the seeds of more complex and difficult con uh, conflicts uh, in, uh, in, uh, in times to come. And at the epicenter of uh, uh, all of this is in many respects the climate challenge because it is the um, uh, changes to the, pla the, plan the planetary climatic system that is uh, a major contributor to uh, what we are now witnessing around the world and it's also uh, happening because what's happening to the climate system is so uh, directly a consequence of how our economy uh, at the, all levels uh, in our world today uh, depends on the energy we get from, from fossil fuels. It's a, a fossil fuel addicted world economy that is driving uh, so much of the problems that we're seeing. Um, you might have heard about a, a prominent uh, 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 campaigner and also scientific authority on uh, the issues of climate change named Bill McKibben. He wrote a piece in Rolling Stone magazine actually recently uh, la uh, labeled the terrifying new math. The terrifying new math. And I would uh, urge uh, all of you who uh, feel you need to know a little bit more of what is actually going on in terms of uh, uh, climate change and uh, the situation when it comes to the rapidly growing emissions of uh, uh, carbon, I uh, would recommend you to read it. You'll get a very good sense of the state of play. And of course, you have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which keeps on producing uh, new reports. And the, the trend is very clear that the scientific consensus overwhelmingly is getting more and more uh, worried, more and more um, um, alarmist about what they see as uh, accelerating uh, impacts way beyond what even a few years ago they thought they would they would see. However, along with the urgent challenge of uh, uh, climate change and environmental degradation more broadly speaking, we have uh, uh, other challenges that are also extremely urgent and uh, that are in fact in many ways uh, related to the climate issue and the environmental issues when it comes to causes and also intertwined with those when it comes to the effects and here we have the the, the problem that is still with us uh, namely uh, human poverty uh, continued uh, scourge of poverty affecting uh, still uh, billions of people uh, we have growing inequality uh, economic inequality in, uh, in, in, in the world that has actually accelerated uh, as a problem over the last uh, couple of decades and related to all of this um, also a very persistent and in some ways worsening problem of social, economic, political exclusion that uh, hits the, particularly the most vulnerable people around the world. And if we think about it, um, we've gone through a phase of human history uh, over the last uh, hundred years where we have seen unprecedented economic growth, unprecedented uh, spreading of uh, prosperity uh, for so many around the world. I mean the, 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 the scale of progress in this period compared to any other historical period is, is breathtaking. In many ways it's a story of human achievement and success in technological terms, in the way we organize our societies, in the way we innovate to create um, uh, wealth for ourselves and for our communities and for our societies. So it's a great story uh, when you look at uh, what where the world came from and where we are today. Um, the problem, of course, is that uh, the, 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 f 
there are certain deep flaws, so to speak, built into the very fabric of this uh, historical age of tremendous progress. And the consequences of those built-in flaws are precisely what's now becoming so apparent. And that's, of course, where uh, the knowledge of what uh, carbon dioxide does to the climate system, along with other greenhouse gases, and uh, you know, is, is, is one such deep flaw that uh, it was, of course, very difficult to foresee when the Industrial Revolution started. But uh, today, certainly, we're seeing the consequences of a, a great blessing actually, uh, in, in economic terms, uh, becoming something of a, 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 a curse when it comes to the unintended effects of uh, building a global economy based to a very large extent on extracting fossil energy sources. Um, and uh, despite the fact that today we are more knowledgeable uh, than at any other t time in history about these linkages between human activity and environmental consequences spilling over into uh, social consequences, uh, making the poverty problem more difficult to solve, making uh, the inequality challenge more difficult to solve. Um, we still have a lag of understanding in our societies uh, uh, that I think slows us down in terms of dealing with the issues at hand. Because a lot of us, a lot of policymakers, a lot of people uh, in all countries still uh, are in the habit and are still thinking that the answer is still more of the same. More exploitation of nature, uh, we need to pump up more fossil fuels faster. Uh, we need more uh, of orthodox economics, uh, more market, more profit. Uh, and through all of that, we will somehow uh, achieve uh, progress uh, and, and lift the last uh, remaining billions living in poverty, out of poverty, and solve our global challenges. Uh, and it's that. Uh, uh, way of thinking, uh, which is in some ways now our uh, greatest enemy, because uh, if we're not able to understand that the model itself is flawed, um, that we can in fact still continue along the same path. It's very, very difficult to uh, build momentum for the kind of fundamental change that is uh, necessary. And in many ways, you know, we have a, a, a rather, you know, if you're with me and you agree with me that somehow we need to address the challenge of poverty, uh, the challenge of inequality, and we need to make sure we can remain safely within the planetary boundaries that we find ourselves in, uh, if you're with me on that, uh, I think you will also um, realize with me that uh, we're, 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 we're faced with a tremendous challenge because the combination of uh, uh, persistent poverty, growing inequality, and growing pressure on our planet makes for a rather, in political terms, toxic brew uh, when it comes to f you know, finding consensus ways, uh, finding, uh, building consensus for a way forward to address the challenges. Because we're faced with a particular political economy at uh, national levels and at global levels where uh, we have winners and losers, where we have powerful vested interests in the, uh, in the status quo, uh, whether we think of uh, the fossil fuel industry and all fossil fuel based industries, whether we think of the 1% as uh, uh, has been uh, very much uh, 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 a term 
in the debate in the United States about uh, inequality, the one percent that actually benefits uh, uh, greatly from the existing model, whether we think uh, more broadly of the growing middle classes around the world that uh, uh, have uh, expanded and, and prospered, which is tied to an existing order that so far has produced good benefits. Um, how do you, in given such powerful vested interests, build up a coalition for a different approach to these very fundamental problems? And add to that that uh, we have also increasingly uh, built a certain, what I call, short-termism. Short-termism into the very fabric of uh, uh, the way we operate in the political realm, where uh, political leaders think only forward to the next election, or next poll even. Uh, but also, when you look at the fabric of uh, the, the, the market economy, where, uh, the, uh, where business leaders too frequently think only in terms of the, the quarter they're in and over to the next quarter in terms of how it will be reported, uh, how, their, how, how the performance of their company will be reported uh, when it comes to um, uh, profitability. So, uh, and of course this is reinforced by what I mentioned before, a, a prevailing orthodox economic paradigm uh, where the profit motive, the profit motive is a key driver. It's, uh, it's a means and it's, so sometimes it seems the end of uh, uh, the goal uh, of uh, uh, maintaining a certain uh, economic order. So it's a complex um, world uh, we live in and it's a very challenging and complex set of forces that are in so, in, if you wish, conspiring, not by will, but, but certainly the effect is conspiring to keep things the way they are and keep uh, the trajectory of uh, uh, development moving in the direction that it's currently in. And of course the problem with that is that we know that uh, that trajectory is fundamentally uh, completely unsustainable. So, and I haven't even talked about population growth, right, which uh, uh, is a factor uh, in, in this context as well. We have already hit 7 billion people, and uh, by 2050 we're estimated, uh, it's estimated that we'll hit uh, at least 9 billion people, and uh, uh, the uh, consequences of that as well is, uh, of course, uh, that policy making for uh, a sustainable future, a, a, a global population that can live within planetary boundaries uh, while at the same time uh, improving economic conditions for, uh, for everybody. That whole proposition is, uh, is becoming more and more demanding and will require tremendous amounts of innovation in, at all levels in terms of e economic policy making, social policy making, uh, technology, of course, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and in terms of how we organize our societies, politically speaking, in terms of governance. So, um, where do we start? Where do we start in terms of uh, addressing these challenges? What do we do? And uh, I have bad news for you here because uh, this is where you come in. This is where you need to step up to the plate, as uh, one likes to say, in the United States and, uh, and, and provide your best efforts to a, uh, a larger global effort that needs to, to be built to turn things around. This is a responsibility that weighs on everybody with ambitions to uh, play a leadership role in public or in private sector uh, in, in, coming, uh, in coming years, in, in coming decades, in, in our shared common future. You cannot escape uh, this responsibility. Um, and what is needed? It's uh, in some ways, conceptually speaking, quite simple. What we do need is a shift of uh, 
uh, values or political priorities and of uh, economic uh, policies uh, to adhere to the principles of sustainable development, which means uh, reconciling and balancing policies across the economic, social, and environmental dimensions, and uh, built into this act, that way of thinking a shift to a thinking and a practice of human development, that it is really uh, about people at the end of the day as opposed to profit margins for the few. And as Bernardo wrote uh, in his seminal book with uh, Amartya Sen, uh, Primero la gente, first the people. Uh, that ethos is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the answer to the challenge that we're faced with. And what we need to see going forward is that all countries, and for this to be made possible and facilitated, hopefully supported by, by, by global agreements, whether it's on climate change or on other issues, but all countries need to put in place policies uh, in three key domains. One is policies to rapidly decarbonize their economies, uh, greening their growth trajectory, uh, protect ecosystems, and uh, green production and consumption patterns. And yes, absolutely, it's very true that affluent societies in the north bear a historic responsibility much larger than developing economies and therefore uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility has to be at the center of uh, uh, the global political deal that is needed in support of this but uh, it's still a matter of urgency f for uh, all countries to embark on this uh, uh, Yes, some with greater speed than others, but it's necessary for all countries to shift trajectory. It's in everybody's own best interest to do so at this point. Uh, we're no longer in a world where some countries can stay on the same old course while others have to, have to change, and that will solve the problem. No, uh, we're now in the same boat together, and all countries need to take action to decarbonize and green their economies. That's the first area. And the second area, and policies here need to be very closely intertwined and related, uh, the second area is to build social cohesion in, uh, much, uh, more, in a much more determined way than we've seen in most societies over the last 20 years when orthodox economic policy was allowed to kind of sh shift social, the social agenda to the side and, we, and, and, and dealing with it as a kind of a, a, um, a marginal safety net issue as opposed to central uh, to economic uh, uh, strategy and policy. That has to change. We need policies to build social cohesion at the center of economic policy making uh, with um, uh, equal opportunities pursued in, in every way possible for, for all people, whether men or women, whether uh, the people of different ethnic groups or uh, uh, different economic backgrounds, and thereby reducing inequality and uh, fostering upward uh, mobility for, for, for people. And the third uh, very related area has to do with the policies to uh, democratize uh, uh, the political process ensure that uh, it really is a democratic inclusive order and not an order that is bought and, and dominated by the very few and uh, as well as uh, policies uh, that helps to democratize economic opportunity for all as well. That uh, the, the means, uh, the tools that you need including the legal means uh, of starting a business, of, of owning property, is not something that only the, the, the elites have access to, but that uh, all people can have access to. So it's about uh, uh, environmental sustainability and greening, uh, decarbonizing, it's about building a different uh, social order 
and insisting on the social factor in economic policy making and it's about polit uh, a, a political program for participation and inclusion. Um, what this means in uh, practical terms is to adopt as a matter of a habit, uh, particularly at the national level of, uh, of policy making, a triple win approach uh, to uh, the economic, social and environmental dimensions of policy making. To consciously drive economic uh, and social and environmental decision making together to look for the opportunities to win, uh, to make gains in social terms, in economic terms and environmental terms through the uh, articulation of strategies, of economic plans and programs, of particular, uh, of, of particular sectoral investment strategies, whether it's on energy or uh, agriculture or uh, transport and what have you. This requires a different mindset in policy making and it requires a different way of working across ministries because we live in a world where government has organized itself in, in silos according to different sectors and themes. So uh, if you're in the social ministry you didn't have to worry about uh, environment or about uh, uh, economic uh, issues. If you're in the Ministry of Planning or Ministry of Finance, you generally didn't have to worry about uh, social issues and uh, the environmental impact of particular economic policies. And if you happen to be in the Environment Ministry, nobody expected you to think about uh, the economy or about social issues. Some countries have actually taken very um, encouraging steps to change this. And um, Brazil is one very good example of uh, putting in place um, uh, institutions in governments that help bring these agendas together in the process of decision making, showing that it's in fact possible to go for the triple wins. Uh, we need new kinds of uh, leaders uh, and new values in leadership at all levels, and in the private sector, in the public sector. This is where, again, you come in. And, uh, and hopefully through the program that, uh, that you're taking part in, you will get some tools that will help you in both being the kinds of leaders we need for the future, as well as um, uh, helping build broader understanding for the kind of leadership that is needed. And just yesterday, I read a very interesting article in Forbes uh, magazine uh, about uh, Martin Luther King. And uh, I guess uh, the article came uh, in because of the fact that, uh, that Martin Luther King's day was celebrated on Monday here in the United States. But the writer made uh, the case that um, Martin Luther King had, uh, in his thinking, uh, foreshadowed the triple bottom line thinking that uh, is now needed uh, in order to create successful and sustainable businesses. And uh, I just thought it was quite interesting that uh, a very important business magazine of today uh, suggests that, uh, the, um, that, that a leader, like an inspiring uh, example like Martin Luther King, uh, has a meaningful uh, message to today's aspiring and existing leaders in business about what should guide their thinking. That's going way beyond the, the previously very narrow obsession with the profit motive. There is of course a very strong need for innovation, as I mentioned earlier, at uh, all levels. We need uh, uh, to invest our best skills and abilities and creative minds in solving problems, whether it's uh, technological uh, solutions uh, to, for instance, the climate problem, uh, but also at the, at the broader level of policy making, we need in innovative policies and we need, and this is uh, my next point, innovation and new approaches to governance. 
I already mentioned the example of uh, Brazil and the uh, need for innovation in uh, uh, governance that can help bring agendas together to avoid the siloed uh, way of working in different uh, sectoral ministries uh, to find ways of forcing um, decision making deliberation of policy of course and discussion but also then decision making that uh, is holistic in nature um, and um, and here it's very important to think broadly about the kinds of things we need to see uh, I mentioned earlier the point about uh, the lack of long-term uh, thinking in government as well as in the private sector and there are reasons why it's difficult to think long term. It's built into the fabric of, uh, um, of, of governance in many countries, in, in almost all democracies. It's very difficult for policymakers to, to think very far ahead because uh, that's not going to help them get elected in the next election. Um, how can one create we, we don't want to throw away democracy, and we and we need to have elections every every uh, four years or so. I think we can all agree to that. But how can you set up other mechanisms that can encourage and help governments think uh, for the public good for the long term? Uh, there are examples of institutions that have been set up in such a way that they can actually think and act long term. And uh, one example is central banks. Uh, they, uh, they, they work somewhat independently from the democratic process, but they are, of course, still uh, accountable for, uh, for, for their results and operate within a democratic setting. And it's possible to think of innovations in uh, institutions that can uh, achieve a similar shift towards more long-term responsible policy making uh, for the common good uh, without compromising the need to have a democratic process with elections every every four years. Uh, this is going to be very important. So formal institutions and what should we do to um, make formal institutions uh, operate uh, so that they become part of the solution of driving towards sustainable development um, and help uh, make commitments let's say for the next 20 or 30 years, um, as opposed to just thinking, uh, what do I pass today in order to get elected tomorrow? That's one very important element. But formal institutions are not going to deliver it all. We also need um, to look at the interplay of uh, formal governance structures with society and uh, enhance the opportunity for building uh, the kinds of coalitions between civil society and government and the private sector that can advance uh, collaboration for the common good in, in, in coming years. Uh, we need enhanced participation by citizenry in a project of society that is for the long term. And again, there's a lot of short-termism also in civil society, uh, campaigns that uh, have a short time horizon. Uh, we need to create opportunities for citizens, for business leaders, for people from government, etc., to work together uh, for uh, in the long term, uh, with a long-term time horizon. In many ways, therefore, we need to. Uh, reform the uh, the order that uh, uh, determines whether society moves in, a, in in one direction or in another. We need to look not just at the national level, but also at the local uh, level of governance and the interface between the local and the national. The interface between public and private, as I've already alluded to, is extremely important the interface between the formal and the informal sectors and, and in a, a formal and informal institutions uh, in society, uh, the interface between command and control approaches of governments and the market, 
And by looking at all of this, to, uh, to put in place the ingredients that can help us uh, change these patterns for the future. But I do come back to the fundamental value proposition um, that uh, I alluded to earlier, uh, because without that we're kind of lost. Uh, and here again I will, I will refer to uh, Bernardo's term, uh, primero la gente, first people. This has to become uh, the standard way of thinking for all people in leadership positions. It's not about uh, uh, the magic wand of uh, the market or about uh, meeting shareholders' expectations or meeting a certain GDP growth target and you think your job is done, you're done great, you can, you can celebrate, you can go on vacation and be, and be proud that you're successful. That doesn't cut it anymore, that's not good enough. Uh, the real test is whether you and I and the organizations or companies that we work for are contributing to uh, human well-being or, or not. Primero la gente. And as part of that, we ne need to make justice a keystone of all policy making. I know um, Amartya Sen uh, is, uh, is um, and I'm very honored to be in his company as also a lecturer for you and I'm sure that he will have spent quite a bit of time elaborating what that means, what the idea of justice needs to mean for, for public policy making of the future. We need to take what we know, what we, we, what we know about uh, what's happening out there the science seriously. Uh, we cannot have policy making that, that kind of uh, takes a light-hearted approach to facts and uh, what the science is, what our, our best knowledge is telling us about what our act, actions are having as consequence. So that has to be built into the fabric of policy making and leadership as well. One cannot continue to uh, drive so-called progress uh, by going uh, in the opposite direction of what this, what some of the best available scientific information is telling us that we must do. That's immoral. It's not right. It's not, it's not just uh, um, unenlightened to ignore science. It's immoral. And that needs to be understood by, by all of us in a much more serious way than it has so far. We need an, a new ethos, a powerful ethos to infuse and to guide our uh, decision making, our policy making, our leadership in uh, enterprise, our leadership in the public realm. Uh, and, and without that ethos, we will continue to get the same results that we've been getting so far. This brings me to my final point, and I promise to end very shortly. Um, my final point is that we're now at a critical juncture in the um, in, in, in our development trajectory looking at it from a political global perspective. Uh, as you're probably aware, uh, for the last uh, 12 years uh, the international community has uh, come together around eight shared development goals, the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, thanks to that, we have been able to make enormous progress in reducing poverty and hunger, in expanding access to water and sanitation for people, in reducing the prevalence of HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, in getting kids to school, in uh, uh, reducing gender inequality in many countries, as well as reducing maternal mortality and child mortality. All of this, uh, we would have made some progress probably without the MDGs, but we made a lot more progress in, uh, in scores of countries around the world thanks to these shared goals. So having shared global goals is something extremely important. But by 2015, we need to have come up with the next set of goals that will guide our actions for the next 
period, whether it's 15 years or 20 years or 30 years, we don't know at this point. That will have to be agreed and decided. But we know that we need a set of goals for the future. And uh, the deadline is 2015, and that actually coincides with the deadline that we also have to come up with a new uh, broad agreement on how to tackle climate change. So this is our time, this is your time um, to contribute to a very important global discussion about what sort of goals should guide our efforts and what sort of world do we want to live in what sort of future do we want to have for ourselves and our children? And we have unleashed an unprecedented global conversation about this topic, and we're making it as inclusive as we can to get all people around the world, give all people ar around the world the opportunity to participate in this global consultation, this global discussion about the future we want. And uh, if we can, make progress on some of these core challenges that we have been talking about now and, and ensuring that those issues are reflected in that development framework of the future, we will make a contribution to turning the tide on these very difficult challenges. I started out by saying that addressing the problem of uh, planetary destabilization, inequality and poverty is almost an impossible task given the vested interests and, 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 and the way these issues intertwine with each other uh, and it's a very toxic brew. But I think at the same time that if we use this opportunity that uh, this global conversation about the future we want uh, to come up with powerful goals for the future and engaging people everywhere in this conversation and build a, a momentum support from people all over the world for a different way of addressing, of, of, of organizing our societies, our economies and organizing our policy making and infusing our policy making with uh, principle that has to do with people and planet and, 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 and long-term well-being for all and justice then we do, in fact, have a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic chance to make a, a, a difference and, uh, and put the world on a different trajectory. This is an enor enormous challenge to all of you. You obviously won't solve this on your own and you won't be alone in, uh, in grappling with these uh, challenges. All I'm asking you is to uh, take this on work with us in the United Nations, work with other people uh, committed to this all over the world and help us all to make a, a, a difference for uh, generations to come. Thank you.